much for the um, introduction and housekeeping, Daryl. I really appreciate that. Our continuing education team is excellent. Uh, hello, everyone, and happy Autism Acceptance Month. I'm so glad you could uh, all join us to be here for this webinar, Autism in Libraries, Resources and Tools. My name is Brittany Wright, and I am the Community Engagement Consultant for the Bureau of Library Development. With me today is Jill Sears, the main library regional manager, and Selena Collar, the senior librarian for the Broward Public Library. Uh, Jill, if you could be so kind as to start us off, that'd be great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, inviting us, Brittany, to share information about our um, software. It's um, a Dan Marino product. It's the virtual interactive training agency agent. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, let it, we're, we've got a little further oh. screen here. We're, we're, okay, uh, one more. Okay, there we go. All right, so a little bit of background about Dan Marino um, Foundation. It was founded by Dan Marino and his wife 28 years ago in response to a lack of resources for their son who is autistic. The Marino campus um, offers education to prepare young adults with autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, they offer employment, social and life skills through post-secondary education. Students must be at least 18 years of age to attend. Coursework is available in three areas um, to gain job skills hospitality, computer technology, and business office support. Students can earn recognized industry certification. So once the students gain employable job skills, the next step is finding and interviewing for a job. And the virtual interactive training agent, and you'll hear Selena and I refer to this as VITA, um, probably interchangeably, so please don't be confused if we slip into calling it VITA. The software was developed by the Marina Foundation and the University of South Carolina, oh, South California. Um, I just gave away what school I'm an alumnus of. Uh, and this provides interactive interview practice for the students in a variety of environments. Go ahead to slide six. Broward County Libraries are really proud to be able to provide this service to adults who have autism and developmental disabilities. This was made possible when the Dan Marino Foundation business manager approached the main library about a partnership between Broward County Library and the foundation. We're right down the street from the Marino campus, which is lucky for us, and that's what spurred um, the partnership, our close proximity, uh, we're open more hours than the school is, so we can give wider um, accessibility to the students. Our community engagement manager met with the Dan Marino Foundation, and now we have the interview software at our regional and flagship libraries for a total of seven library locations. And access is not limited to the Dan Marino Foundation students, but any adult with autism or developmental disabilities may make an appointment to practice job interview skills. Um, uh, are there any questions in the chat? This was just a pretty basic background of the software and how it came about. I'm going to turn this over to Selena Collar who has uh, worked with staff to train them in using the software and in best practices for interacting with the students. And she has interacted with many of the students. So, Selena, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Jill, for the introduction. So basically, to, the software is a really great tool uh, for helping any students with autism or any other type of disability similar to that. The uh, trick is with the software, if you want to think about potentially purchasing it or partnering with Dan Marina Foundation, it only works on Microsoft Windows computers. It is not compatible with Apple computers. So as the same, hopefully most of you have Windows 10 by now. Our version of the software requires a staff member to be present to administer the test. 
Uh, and then it requires two monitors or two screens, one for the instructor or tutor and one for the student or the person practicing their job interview skills. So when we were getting training, we actually had a Dan Marino official come to our location and do a staff training with several staff members. And they basically told us that with the software to be most effective, you need to have three to five sessions to really see improvement. And with the research that the Dan Marino people have conducted, they found that 80% of their users improved their job skills after three to five sessions, and that 61% we're able to secure employment, which is actually very good numbers because that population is typically underemployed. So, so just to give you kind of a nice overview of the software, there are six characters or avatars, and you can see there's quite a bit of diversity there. And each character has unique questions and answers. So there's a possibility for combination of hundreds of responses so that you know, you're not asking the same interview questions over and over again. And then there's also uh, dispositions or moods, like soft touch, neutral, and hostile. So typically when I use the software with a student for the first time, I usually use soft touch or neutral. Uh, I don't usually start out with hostile because I want to give people time to kind of get comfortable and practice their skills and see how well they do before I start to challenge them. And then what's also nice about the software is it has unique backgrounds. So, you know, there's a hotel lobby as a location, a restaurant, executive office, conference room, and break room. So you have a variety of interview locations that you can select that uh, the avatar or the interviewer uh, will be the, so they just can kind of get practice. So usually what I recommend too is that before you make the appointment, it's kind of good to confirm with the student that what jobs they're interested in or what field, like are they interested in IT or hospitality or maybe they want to work at a grocery store, you know, it's kind of good to get a feel of what kind of jobs they're looking for and what their background is. Currently, we have the software installed on one of our instructor com computers in our cyber computer classroom. And basically this, you don't have to have one room dedicated just for this purpose. It could be a multi-purpose room that you just need to schedule um, activities in. So we use uh, that classroom and it's used by different groups. And so we have the you know, customer or student schedule an appointment. And then there, the instructor computer is a com nice traditional computer monitor, but the second monitor is a large screen TV uh, where the student will, will put a chair in front of the TV and the student can sit in front of there uh, during the session. And then you'll see in the software, that's where you get the opportunity to select your interviewer and your disposition or mood. So that's what happens when you first log in to the software. And then you'll see there's also the option to select location. And once you pick all those options, then you can actually launch the scenario. And as I was saying, you need two monitors. So as I was saying, in our, one of our labs, we got the com one computer and then we got one television monitor for the student. And I'll show you some more pictures here. So you see here is a picture of the student view and the instructor view. So the student view, if everything's working correctly, they should be able to see the avatar with whatever location or background you picked. And they should also be able to hear the, uh, the uh, avatar speak uh, with audio and stuff. So you gotta have some kind of speaker or audio setup. Even You could even use the TV audio if you have a good TV. And then the instructor view, you'll see it's much more wordy and it includes the questions uh, that you would ask the student or that they, you, you basically you, you select questions and answers and responses during the interview. So here's a close-up view of the instructor view. And so typically you'll see there's the event log on the far left there. That is the questions that you have asked the student already. And usually what I do is I start with the pinned primary, which is kind of the second group there. And that kind of goes in order of introductory questions like, you know, hi, how are you? How did you hear about this job? Like those kind of introductory questions that you would start the interview off with. And then I kind of usually just go in order using the pinned primary because that has some really good questions there. 
And usually you want to do one session with maybe six questions for the first time around to kind of get the student comfortable with the software. And then you'll notice on the right here, we have opening, engagements, elaborations, distractions, acknowledgments, and answers. So you'll see that like at one point you might ask uh, the student like, you know, do you have any questions about this job or this position? And at that point, that's where using the answer box would be very uh, very useful for you. And you can select an answer like, oh, you know, HR will contact you if they're interested or check our website for details. So you have some kind of generic response you can give them to answer those kind of questions. And then distractions are kind of good, not necessarily during the first session, but the distractions, because during a normal interview, there's a potential that there could be a distraction, like maybe the person coughs or sneezes, or there's a phone ring or something like that. So it's kind of good to have a little distraction in there, maybe on the second or third session, uh, just so that, you know, if a real distraction happens in real life, the student won't be, you know, too much distracted by it. And then what's nice is that if you have trouble reading these little boxes, there's a little dialog box in the corner there, so you can make the little dialog box bigger, kind of like what I have here on the left side of the screen, and you can see all the responses. So when you see the green face, uh, that means it's like soft touch or friendly mood or disposition. And of course, the, the gray face is more neutral uh, responses, and then the red face is kind of more hostile responses. And then there's this little box here called second chance. I usually avoid that box because it has kind of hostile questions and responses. So I usually don't use it. And then the other great tool you get when you uh, purchase the software or, you know, you maybe get a grant or something like that to take advantage of the software is they give you a copy of the uh, Vita interview guided workbook. And what's nice is it has activities and exercises for the student to prepare for job interviews, such as, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Why are you applying for this position? Tell me about yourself. Do you have any questions for me? So it kind of has the nice exercises and examples to help the student think of responses they might think uh, use during a job interview. And then typically when I do the appointment, I usually go do two or three kind of interviews in the same session. Uh, kind of we do the first one is kind of a warm up to get them comfortable with, you know, talking to the avatar and responding to the avatar. And then this, you know, and then once they get comfortable, then we do it again. And then I usually see improvements pretty quickly after just one or two uh, interview sessions. Now, is there a question? There is a question in the chat. Um, it says, many job interviews are done by companies. Does the program accommodate more than one interviewer avatar? Uh, no, the software is, you're, you're limited to one avatar at a time for each session. But, you know, once you finish the session, you could X out and select a different character. Yeah, so you, you have options, like, you know, if you pick the avatar and you decide, okay, the next session I want to use a different character or avatar, you can. It's just, you can't change kind of in the middle of the session. I would recommend finishing the interview first and then picking a different uh, character for the, different, uh, for the next session. And I usually have notes for each student and I'll write down, you know, what character and disposition I used just so I can keep track of it. And then also, too, I always recommend um, emailing. Uh, like, once you purchase the software, you kind of are able to use the guide and you can email it to students. And you would also, I print a physical copy for the in person appointment because oftentimes the student forgets to bring it with them. And then, usually, after we do the use the software, I will go through the guidebook with them, kind of step by step, and try to encourage them to complete the exercises on their own. If they don't feel comfortable doing that, I may assist them with helping them think of responses uh, with the exercises and give them some ideas and suggestions. But I definitely recommend it. It's a very good tool and very much in line with the software. And then what's also nice is they provide you with kind of a, a grade sheet, or they call it the uh, you know VITA interview sign-in form. And this is good to keep a copy and for your records in your office 
you know, in a secure location, of course. And then also, too, I provide a copy to the student so that they can see their feedback and what areas they need to improve upon. They have a, a kind of a grading scale of zero to four. Uh, I've never really given anyone a zero, but usually on their first interview session, I might give them a one or two because usually there's areas where they need to improve. Um, and four would mean that they did pretty much everything perfect. So usually when they're doing the first few sessions, they're kind of in the two or three range, or maybe even the one range. Um, and they gr have you grade them on several different, you know, criteria, like did they actively listen? Did they have closing questions, their first impressions? And I always try to tell the student before the appointment, they, hey, like you need to pretend like, what is your dream job or what job are you currently looking for? Oh, you want to work for a grocery store? Okay, pretend that you're applying at your local grocery store for a job. And think about the kind of questions they might ask you or what skills you have or experience you have or volunteer work. Because even volunteer work counts. Or if they did an internship at school or they were a student worker at school, you know, that, that counts because uh, you learn job skills on those kind of volunteer opportunities. And it's very important when working with students that you have a quiet private room without many distractions. I mean, because first of all, doing a job interview is very stressful for everybody, but especially anyone with uh, you know, autism or any other disabilities, it may be challenging. And then I also make sure to remind the student by email or phone. You know, After I interact with the person, I kind of figure out, do they respond better to email or phone calls? And so a week before the appointment, I'll recall them to remind them and be like, hey, is this time and date still good for you? And then I usually definitely call or email them the day before just to double confirm. And of, of course, same, I've had this problem with other things too. You know, sometimes people cancel appointments or reschedule appointments. So you just got to be prepared for that sort of situation to happen. And then, of course, if I can, I ask the student if they have a resume before the appointment and ask them to email it to me. Um, it's okay if they don't have a resume, you can still do the interview, but at least you need to find out what careers or jobs that they're interested in, what their skills are, so they can either, you know, tell you or give you a resume. And then, as I was saying, I recommend reviewing the guidebook. You don't have to maybe read it cover to cover, but reviewing it before the appointment just so you're ready to share it with the student. And I always bring a copy of the workbook with me to the appointment so we can talk about it after uh, we conduct an interview session. And as I was saying, they recommend starting out with six interview questions and then taking a short break and then, you know, talking with the student about what they did right and what they did wrong. So it's always good to take notes kind of when you're facilitating the interview and selecting questions that you're going to ask the student. And then as far as staff training, the software isn't too terribly difficult to learn. As I was saying, we did an in-person training with a Dan Marino staff member. And then after that training, uh, Jill and I met with two different, maybe one or two different groups of staff members from different branches, uh, especially the regional branches, locations, the seven locations that she mentioned that have the software. We made sure that there was one or two people from each of those locations at the training. And we took turns actually using the software and being, you know, you know, being the facilitator or, or being interviewed. And so we took turns. And so that was great for people to have kind of have hands-on experience. So if possible, if you know that there's going to be a certain group of staff that are using the software, it'd be good to have an in-person training where they can practice using the software. Because unfortunately, the software doesn't really work well with WebEx or Adobe Connect or Zoom. Uh, just something about the audio doesn't seem to work with those software applications for video conferencing. So it's definitely something for in-person. As I was saying, we covered a lot of information. So are there any questions in the, in the queue about the um, VITA interview software from Dan Marino Foundation? We do have um, another couple of questions in the chat. Do you partner with outside organizations that help in guiding autistic persons throughout the training process? Do you have a training program for with autistic persons? Um, as I was saying, uh, can you repeat that question? It didn't quite come through. You were saying about something about training with... Sure. Um, so it's a two-part question. The first part is, do you partner with outside organizations that help in guiding autistic persons throughout the training process? And then the 
second part is, do you have a training program for working with autistic persons? So I think this is asking about like staff training and, you know, do your, did you or your staff go through training specific with working with this population? Um, or are you partnering with external organizations that help working with people with autism? Uh, as I was saying, as of right now, we had the, we, as I was saying, we had the one training session with the Dan Marino staff member. And then basically after attending that training session, um, me and Jill con conducted two more training sessions. As I was saying, um, with our thing, with our agreement with them, we kind of had to do our own tech support and things of that nature. Gives you um, guidelines to work with. Yeah, and as I was saying, we use, as I was saying, the VITA guided workbook, like the interview workbook that I was talking about, uh, that is a really good workbook to review as well. So as I was saying, I know that um, if you end up purchasing the software, they do help, Dan Marino helps with the, uh, the initial installation and they do provide tech support for 12 months, but you kind of have to negotiate with them about training. Uh, but as I was saying, basically I felt kind of comfortable with the software after one session of training because it's not that difficult to use. But I did have to consult with IT just to make sure I got the double monitors working correctly. And so as, at this moment in time, we're not really partnering other than with Dan Marino. But um, I definitely think that partnership with other nonprofits would definitely be good, especially ones that work with that population. Is there any other questions? And if anyone thinks of any other questions later, um, they can email me and Jill at cybrary at broward.org if you come up with any questions later on. Okay, and we got another one in the chat. It's, do you review and critique resumes as well? Um, with this particular project, no. Um, but as I saying, sometimes I, you know, because I work in the computer center, sometimes I make appointments one-on-one -on -one for resume assistance. But we do have this product uh, called BrainFuse. And what's great about BrainFuse is it has this product called Job Now, and they can actually get online assistance with their resume. And we have access to the software called Optimal Resume. So usually we refer customers to that resource and also we do have a partnership with Career Source Broward, um, and Career Source Broward has a lot of, they even have like a phone line that people can call to get assistance with resumes and stuff. So we also, we, so we can refer customers to those two resources as well. And then, is additional training available for staff members who did not take part in the original training? Uh, yeah, I created, actually I created a, like a cheat sheet or tip sheet for staff. So if staff could, so it has a lot of good notes about all the different features of the software that I just talked about, as well as additional information. And so they can always review that guidebook and, we're, and also if they need more assistance, they could always call me or email me and schedule an appointment for assistance in training. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, it might be good to have a point person. Like if you decide to uh, purchase the software to have a point person, they kind of can help people navigate. But as I was saying, I do other responsibilities too. So, I mean, you know, you can have juggle it with multiple duties as well. Uh, do we have any uh, further questions? Well, as Selena said, if you do come up with some more questions, please feel free to email the cybrary at broward.org, and we will do our very best to answer your questions. And um, I believe, let's see, Brittany has some resources that she is going to share. Hello. Hello there. Can anyone hear us? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, oh, I was. Hi. I'm just <laughs> sorry. I was just waiting behind Thanks. the scenes for it to switch over to me for uh, <laughs> presentation purposes. But yes, don't go anywhere, folks. I've still got um, <laughs> a couple of resources to share because I was looking at the chat. <laughs> also, it does look like another question did come in for you guys. Um, so I guess I can just quickly ask that of y'all while they're... Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Or... <laughs> um, the question was, what is the age limit for teens to come for an interview? As I was saying, our, this is kind of for people 18 and up. As I was saying, I think, I believe the software is kind of developed more for adults. Um, but I know with Dan Marino Foundation, it's 18 and up. So I would say it's the same for us. Okay. Um, that's good. Can everyone see my screen? I had to do some fiddling, so I'm not sure. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, as I said earlier, I'm Brittany Wright. I'm the Community Engagement Consultant for the Bureau of Library Development. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. And I will just be sharing uh, mostly some sort of, excuse me, I will be sharing some general resources for library staff to use when uh, working with autistic patrons. Uh, that is my contact information if you'd like to discuss it further. And I'm also realizing that I believe the <laughs> slideshow started at the beginning. So just give me just a moment to very quickly get, there we go. <laughs> um, so the first resource I'd like to talk about is from the Charlotte Edwards McGuire Medical Library. Uh, they have a number of resources for library staff, which you can see on the screen. The ebooks in particular cover topics such as communication in autism, Asperger syndrome, and helping autistic students. There are videos explaining what autism is and about living with autism. The guide also contains an assistance email, which a library staff can use if they have any further questions. It's a very uh, dense and informative resource, uh, so it's very beneficial. The next resource is Project PALS, uh, which are instructional modules to help librarians and library staff learn how to serve autistic patrons more effectively. The modules in order are about autism in the library, arranging the library environment, communicating with individuals with autism, and interacting with technology. All of these modules are available on Web Junction, which is free to use. You only need to create an account. Um, one that I'm sure most of us are already familiar with is the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, or CARD. The center is divided into seven regional sites centered around public universities. For example, the uh, CARD site for Tallahassee is FSU, so that pairs really well with uh, Project PALS on the previous slide. Uh, as an example of a... Uh, of, of outside of, of course the Broward Public Library, but another Florida library that is doing um, some good work for autistic patrons is the Osceola Library System. Uh, they partnered with a vendor to create a sensory friendly space in their library. The library has sensory bags which contain noise reducing headphones, fidget tools, visual cue, cue cards, etc. Uh, branches of the library system also have a weighted lap pad upon request. And each library has a designated quiet area, which I would love to have in my workspace, along with those noise canceling headphones. I have a pair at home and they're wonderful. Um, one resource that I really, really love is the Autistic Self Advocacy Network or the ASAN. The ASAN is a nonprofit organization that believes the goal of autism advocacy should be a world in which autistic people enjoy equal access, rights, and opportunities. The really important note about the ASAN is that they're run by and for autistic people. One of the resources that they've put out is Welcome to the Autistic Community. It's a nine chapter book explaining what autism is, who can be autistic, autism facts, and other topics relating to autism and autism advocacy. It's also written in um, plain language with a lot of key terms highlighted. So if you mouse over them, it'll explain them to you. 
it's a really good resource and I'm glad that it's available online. Uh, they also have uh, color communication badges, which were first developed by Autism Network International. They're designed to help communicate the degree to which a person wants to participate in new social interactions and with who. So there are three colors, red, yellow, and green, where red is basically saying that you don't want to communicate with anyone at this time. Yellow says that you're open to communicating, but only with people who you know or whether or if that person with the yellow badge approaches another person first or green that basically says, hey, come up and chat with me or, you know, I'm open to conversation all the time. Uh, I think it'd be really helpful at conferences and uh, meetings of that nature and just in the library in general. Um, another resource is Libraries and Autism, We're Connected. Uh, it is a project to promote autism awareness and acceptance. The graphics has uh, high and low resolution versions of the Libraries and Autism logo. It also has uh, customer service tips for uh, assisting with autistic patrons or helping patrons with you know, autistic people, such as ignoring a patron who may be rocking, quietly humming, wiggling, the sort of things that don't need, you know, intervention from library staff. Uh, they also provide grants, though they're currently suspended for the 2021 to 2022 grant cycle. They do hope to return to the project in the fall of 2021. Ordinarily, these grants can be used to fund a new program, bring an existing service or program to your library, or enhance a program or service currently being offered at the library. All of the programs must benefit autistic people or their families directly or indirectly. Project Enable is a series of training modules designed to expand non-discriminatory access by librarians. The um, six, uh, there are six topics in module six, which is targeting autism in libraries which is what is autism, diagnosis and characteristics of autism, creating an autism-friendly library, autism-friendly library and information programs, services, resources, partnering with the greater community to support children and, and adults with autism, and library support and opportunities, employment of people on the spectrum. And if I remember correctly, all of these modules uh, are also free to access. Um, some other resources, as we come to the end of my section, is of course, uh, you know, the American Library Association has a book, uh, Library Services for Youth with Autism Spectrum Disorder. It was written by Leslie S.J. Farmer and covers how to build a library literacy program geared toward autistic youth. Um, one really interesting resource is the Autism Internet Modules, or AIM, there are over 50 modules currently covering topics such as cognitive differences, girls on the autism spectrum, rules and routines, and more. There's no cost to reviewing the modules. You only need to make an account. So it's very, very fascinating. You can seriously spend some time going through them. Um, and last but certainly not least is the Florida Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. This is the state agency that helps people with physical and mental disabilities prepare for, get, advance in, or keep a job. And as of 2020, the division has been around for 100 years, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that concludes uh, the resources that I wanted to share. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? Hi, Brittany. I noticed that the, they were just wanting to ask, uh, will these resources and slides be available uh, later on? Um, I believe, I know the presentation itself will be available, and I believe also the slides. Okay, good. Casey is saying that, yes, they will be available after the webinar. Whoops. Um, And it says, are you aware of grant opportunities for serving autistic patrons? Um, at this time, outside of the grants that were being offered at, 
uh, libraries and autism. I feel as if I had seen one. Um, I thought I had seen one last week, but I'm not sure. I know, I know, I did see. Um, if you, uh, if you yourself, or if you happen, you know, to know a patron in need, there are, you know, grants for that. I'm thinking of a few off the top of my head, but specifically uh, for like libraries or programs, I can't recall any at the moment. Okay, um, it looks like there's no more questions. So um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. As a reminder, this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel. We're going to stop recording now, but we will hang around for another minute or two just to make sure if there's any more questions we can.